Great. So, um, official, official welcome um, to this last episode of um, Kaduri Earth Program 2023 talk series by international ecological speakers. Um, this is Ying um, from Guangzhou, uh, mainland China. Um, I have been following this uh, KEP talk for the last two years. Uh, if I miss the live session, I will watch the recordings for sure. So I'm, yeah, so very happy to have everyone here. And so I'm a bit of int introduction at the beginning. I'm a friend and collaborator of uh, Kaduri Earth Program. And thanks to the connection, being a uh, Schumacher College alumni and also being on the path of holistic transformation and community building globally for the past decades. And um, I'm now actually connecting with you all from Thailand. And for the last two weeks, guess what? I was in Gaia Ashram, which was co-founded 10 years ago by P. Om. You remember Om if you were in this uh, KEP talk series three months ago in September. So I feel like we're so alive and honored kind of passing the mic from Piom to um, Manish this time. It's kind of passing the batons. And so before I invite uh, Manish uh, to share, I would like to um, do a bit of introductions of the program of this uh, talk series of Manish and also some logistics. Um, yeah, if you are the first time uh, attending this talk series, um, Kaduri Earth Program is an initiative co-created by KFBG. It's um, Kaduri Farm and Botanic Garden in, based in Hong Kong, and it's networks of collaborators and volunteers. By integrating the various strands of KFBG's nature conservation sustainable living and holistic education program, it provides life transforming learning experience that reconnects people with themselves, each other and the rest of nature and enable them to cultivate resilience in the face of the global challenges. And this talk series is one of the established programs of Kaduri Earth Program, short for CAP that invites uh, work um, renowned practitioners and dreamers to share their wisdoms from action. They learn from action. And um, an introduction of Manish, I hope um, like now as I am sharing all this, we can take a moment of settling down in wherever you are so that you won't feel like this introduction is too long and you, are, you cannot wait for um, Manish, um, yeah. So today we have Manish Jain from India to speak on the topic of from deathlyhood to a livelihood. I, I know that most of you are kind of very surprised and and uh, in um, inspired by deathlyhood and these two terms of today's topic from deathlyhood to a livelihood. And um, a bit about Manish, and I know that um, you might have already um, read his um, biography, but I still want to um, mention that Manish is uh, one of the leading planetary voices for reimagining education and de-schooling our lives. He has served for the past 25 years as Chief Beavers, a car ecosystems builder of um, um, Shikshanta, the People's Institute for Rethinking Education and Development based in Budapur, India. And he's also a co-founder of several innovative educational experiments in the world, which I'm not gonna name out because there are a lot. <laughs> and prior to that, um, he has served like in UNESCO, UNICEF, World Bank, etc. And uh, if you think he's always like alternative, so I should mention like his past life, which is really like uh, it, it leads in this mainstream society. So I have to mention um, Manish worked as an investment banker with Morgan Stanley and well, I, 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 I guess this is his own work. He has been trying to unlearn his master's degree in education 
from Harvard University and a bachelor degree from Brown University, like yeah, Ivy League uh, University from United States. So after introducing about CAP and um, also about money exchange, before the talk, there are a few logistic reminders. Um, first of all, we would really want to invite you to turn on your camera so that we can see you and we can connect to you face to face. Um, secondly, if you want to interact with us anytime and you can type in the chat box, comments, questions, and in Chinese or in English, all welcome. And thirdly, there's a simultaneous um, translation happening in the background in Cantonese and in Mandarin. You can see there's a two box, um, two bar, sorry. Um, you can just select the language um, in which you want to um, listen to. And last but not least, uh, in case of any technical problems, please contact, um, let me see, a host. I guess it can be Jamie or Zeman. Yeah, you can see. So this is my opening and let's welcome Manish Jain. Thank you so much, Manish. Thank you. Namaste to everyone. Um, greetings from uh, India. Um, I thought that we could start with a little uh, game uh, to just uh, help again everyone settle in and focus and be together. So um, I invite you to uh, um, just start by shaking your shoulders a little bit, loosening them up, getting in in your seat, filling your shoulders. And um, uh, after you feel a little bit loose, let's have a big laugh together. Ha <laughs> uh, And then next I'll invite you to wiggle your fingers, stretch them, do a little bit of like this, wiggle them. And at the and then let's all laugh together again. <laughs> I don't see my translators laughing. <laughs> um, and then um, just stretch your arm up a little bit, little bit stretch, feel the pull here, other side. And one more left. <laughs> and last one. Let's just do three claps together. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Hope that is just. Uh, uh, whenever I'm nervous, my grandmother always reminded me to play a little game, laugh a little bit smile a little bit and that takes all the, the tension out. Uh, so uh, thank you for playing with me. Um, today's talk, uh, I'm really actually uh, excited uh, to be uh, an honor to be here as the closing speaker of the series this year. Uh, one of my um, elders and uh, favorite people in the world, Satish Kumar opened the series and I feel very uh, blessed to be able to close the series with so, so many amazing speakers over the past couple of months. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, what I call deadlyhoods versus a livelihoods. And so um, maybe you can put the first image up for me, um, Jamie. Um, and um, so my uh, when I say deadlyhoods, um, People wonder what is that, and when I talk about deadlyhoods, it's it's um, there's a number of um, careers uh, and orientation um, that um, are tied to. So today, you know, when we talk about um, uh, the series, I think there's um, three E's I would like to bring in that we should in a triangle together. One is ecology, which is which is one of the core focuses, but we cannot today talk about ecology properly without talking about 
uh, economics and um, education, ecology, economics, education. Um, and um, so the first image, please, with the bulldozer. Um, so I would like to um, say when we talk about deadly hoods, these are the kinds of careers and work that is uh, destroying the, the planet and also destroying our souls. Uh, many people, um, yes, uh, so much of that, um, this image of the bulldozer eating up the earth is the kind of economy that we are today trapped in the world um, with. This is the extractivist economy, we call it. Um, with this bulldozer, you can probably put some um, different tanks also behind it and uh, uh, soldiers, which is, makes it the, you know, the mil military extractivist economy. And this is what today we are uh, kind of trapped in. And these are the things that not only, as I said, are destroying uh, our relationships and uh, with the rest of nature, but um, also um, our own connection to self and our own um, awareness about ourselves. So we've heard this uh, phrase in English, uh, soul-sucking jobs. So what I want to do, um, what I meet so many people today, both students who are in uh, schools and colleges and um, also people who are in their um, careers, they join either, you know, maybe they're bankers or consultants or engineers or uh, lawyers, but many people are concerned with what's happening in the world today. And they wonder, what should I do? Uh, they can see the career. So my own uh, journey, as, as uh, Ying had shared, I was, um, since I was a kid, I went to, uh, uh, wanted to serve the world. I wanted to do something good for society. And so it took me to the major centers of power, what are considered the major centers of power in the world. And I thought, if I get in those positions, I can really help people, help the planet. And as I got into those positions, I started to see that um, there are all of these careers which are um, being we're being prepared for are actually um, taking us away from ourselves and from actually helping the planet. And they keep the current system in place, uh, what we call business as usual. And not only are they keeping the current system in place, they're financially benefiting from keeping the system in place. So, um, so I started actually when I was working there, I tried to bring changes and I realized that um, the, the, the current system is um, um, both a very entrenched kind of um, uh, uh, game that people are, are benefiting from, and also that um, the uh, the rest of the world is told to try to catch up to this game. And if you work harder, if you play harder, if you study harder, that one day you can be a part of that game. And so one uh, two things I realized when I was working in these positions was that one, if you um, it's very difficult to catch up. Most of the world is being told the developing world is if you catch up, you can, if you, you know, you'll catch up one day. And, and then we found that every time people try to catch up, the rules change, the system changes a bit and people are in continu continuous catch up mode. But then something deeply hit me that um, there's a saying that if you beat them at their own game, you lose everything. So actually the places where we catch up and we think we're going to win, we actually lose everything. And that happened to me personally when I was on that journey. Um, and I started feeling, okay, I've become successful in the system's terms, but who am I really? What do I really believe in? Am I able to live my values? Am I creating the world that I, I think that we need? Am I able to change the system? Um, these questions really... Um, started to pinch me more and more. Um, and I thought about what am I really doing in my career? Am I just um, making rich people richer or am I protecting uh, the, um, uh, finding ways to confuse people and protect those uh, institutions and structures that are 
destroying the planet or am I financing uh, the destruction or am I um, uh, cleaning up the mess, trying to clean up the mess from all of the destruction that is happening? Uh, so I started questioning all of this. And when I was 28 years old, I went into a deep kind of crisis of disillusionment. I uh, really could not think of what to do now. Uh, and I think many people I meet around the world are in this kind of crisis. We know there's a big, the planet is in a very difficult position. Human beings are very difficult position. Um, and what to do. So uh, we started to talk about maybe a different way. Um, and that's what we call a livelihoods. Um, maybe Jamie, you can put up the second slide. So one thing I was saying that, you know, when uh, most of the universities and the schools are, are preparing us for, us for deadlyhoods. And one of the indicators of that is that um, if you think about it, what is the most talked about topic in the university? And um, I don't think it's about how, what do we do about climate change or how do we reconnect with the rest of nature? I think the most talked about topic is what is your financial package? And that is such a dominant uh, decision-making um, framework for people that they forget that there's many other uh, things to think about, the social, the emotional, the environmental, the spiritual, um, the social justice kinds of considerations when we choose what kind of work we should do. And um, so I think that, uh, you know, the time is coming now where more and more people are questioning, is it just financial package that matters? Or maybe there's something else that might mean much more to us in terms of the work we can do in the world. I think the equation that many of us were educated with was something like, you know, you study hard in school, you get good grades, then you get a degree, and then you'll get a good job with a good financial package, and then you'll buy stuff, uh, all the stuff you need, and then you'll be happy in life. So I think this equation is kind of falling apart for many people. Um, and they realize, again, if we even if we have all of the things, it doesn't mean that we are happy or that we are spiritually content or fulfilled or we feel more connected with others. Um, it's oftentimes uh, what my own experience was when I was working in many of these fields was I felt, you know, the th people I thought were the most powerful and the most um, uh, wealthiest, they actually felt the most emptiest and um, alone and scared. Um, so it was a very strange paradox for me to think, oh, I'm in the centers of power and actually feeling a very deep sense of powerlessness, which is what made me... Uh, Ultimately, when I was 28, I resigned from those positions and I thought, let me go back to my uh, community in India and uh, start to learn or what I call now unlearn uh, with my village grandmother. And she helped me start to see that there is much more in life than the financial package. There is much more. And the strange thing is, uh, I think, or the perverse thing is that our financial package gets intertwined with our sense of self-worth that we think, you know, we are what are our, our, what's in our bank account or we are worthy of respect or love because of what's in our bank account. And so we forget that we are much more than uh, that and the choices and the relationships and uh, that we keep our health. Um, all of these ultimately are uh, very important in happiness um, and, and also a sense of self, a life well, well lived. Um, so when we started to, the um, uh, last couple of years, we have uh, been working in the Ecoversities Alliance, which is a network of alternative universities around the world to, um, to open up this idea of, of careers and work, what is our work in the world? What should I be doing? Uh, many of you probably know about the Ikigai, uh, Ikigai framework, Japanese framework, which, uh, which uh, says, you know, what am I good at? What do I love doing? What can I get paid for? And what is the work that is needed in the world? So when we talk about our livelihoods, we're really trying to go deeper into this question of 
what is the work that is needed in the world and where do I fit in that? Um, in India, we have a, um, uh, 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 two words, danda, which is like your work or your business uh, and dharam, which is your spiritual path. And what I think we are stuck right now is that our spiritual path and our work in the world has been separated. All over Asia, there was an alignment. The, the philosoph philosophical moorings all over Asia was that ultimately these two, our spiritual work and our work, uh, material work, are have to be aligned. But in the last, I think, 50 to 100 years, there's been a... Uh, a separation of these things that my I can do any kind of work during the week and I go to uh, uh, um, Sunday or Friday or or whatever day I go and I can uh, pray and I am on my spiritual path is something separate. And so I think when we talk about a livelihoods, we're trying to come back to a philosophical morning that that emerge that kind of realigns these two that my work, material work in the world is not separate from my spiritual work. Um, so um, we have been trying to uh, uh, open up this. And for me, that has been very personally very important is to see that how does, um, how does my uh, spiritual values and my financial needs or material needs, how do they come into alignment? So in the Ecoversities Alliance, we have been exploring this question for the last few years and saying, okay, what are the careers? What are the, what's the work that can help us um, heal ourselves um, and also uh, heal, heal with the planet? Um, and so I would ask you to raise that uh, next slide, please. So we came up with four circles of criteria to kind of look at um, for uh, thinking about what is the work that is needed. We call it the circles of a livelihood. So when I say a livelihoods, I mean, basically what is the work that ma is making me come alive, my community come alive and my ecosystems come alive again. Um, and we had four sets of questions to offer people to reflect on the work that is that they're doing. And so the first core question is related to my own sense of purpose. Um, am I doing work that gives me joy and meaning? Um, I think that I've seen a lot of people who actually um, uh, don't like their jobs. Uh, they don't enjoy them. They're, they spend a lot of time planning their holidays because they don't find their jo job meaningful or worthwhile. Um, and if you ask this question, you know, do you believe what you're doing? Is it making the world a more beautiful place? I think majority of people would say, uh, no, I don't think the world is doing that. the work that I do is doing that. Um, there was a anthropologist named David Graeber. He, he made a, a book called Bullshit Jobs. So he was saying that actually most of the jobs that people are doing in companies and in government, if they disappeared tomorrow, it wouldn't really make a difference. Um, so I think the first question we wanna say, is it what I'm doing, does it give me personal joy and meaning? Is it aligned to a sense of purpose? Um, and uh, the second uh, layer of question is that, am I doing work that replenishes various forms of real wealth? What I call real wealth is health, our social bonds, the rest of uh, our natural ecosystems, local knowledge systems that we have. Um, am I doing work that is that? And I differentiate money is a, a tool that we use. Um, in India, there is a goddess Lakshmi. Um, and she has been called the goddess of wealth. And I think in many, many uh, traditions around Asia, there are... Um, uh, various gods and goddesses who are associated with wealth. And one of the deepest, I think, uh, uh, blunders or confusion that we've made is that we confuse wealth with money. And I think that uh, there is a money system in place. Um, uh, this money system, uh, and so I would say that any, any uh, form of wealth should give me a feeling of abundance. 
and generosity. If it is a real form of wealth, I would feel like to, I would want to share it with others. I should feel more confident, more connected to people. And what I've seen is, um, and this is an interacting with lots of millionaires and billionaires, that people who have more wealth uh, don't feel that oftentimes. They feel a sense of scarcity, uh, isolation, fear. Um, and so, um, but when we have, let's say, healthy, uh, a good sense of well, uh, health, we feel very abundant. We feel more energetic. We feel like sharing that energy with others. If we have a good sense of um, social connections and bonds, a uh, sense of love and care, that uh, manifests itself in many ways. And hospitality, for example, again, which is one of the all over Asia, I've seen great traditions of hospitality. So um, what we're saying is that something like I would offer you the metaphor of like, um, today the money system is dominant, but can we um, compost the money system? Can we take the money system and rebuild it back into real forms of wealth? Because what we've been doing up to now in the last, let's say 150, 200 years, is that we have been taking out uh, all of these uh, minerals and uh, gas and oil uh, from the earth, and we have been converting it to money. Forests even, our, our soils, our air, we've been converting it to money. And so you can see almost like the uh, depletion of a lot of natural resources or what we say na our natural relatives, um, and uh, it's associated with the growth of the money system. And so what I'm saying that if the work we do, if we can take money uh, and start to compost it and bring it back and do replenishing our water systems, our soils again, our um, uh, forests, our seeds, um, our, uh, uh, so this would be part of the work that I'm doing. Am I taking that money and trying to rebuild these, these forms of uh, wealth, which gives me a sense of abundance? And so right now, what I would say that a lot of the decisions that we're making, you can see at COP what happened. A lot of the decisions that are being made for the planet are from a sense of scarcity and fear. Lead decision makers are making decisions with that mindset as their dominant. The toxic culture that we live in is producing fear and scarcity all the time around us. So what I'm what I'm suggesting is that if we are able to move to a position of where I feel abundance, a sense of care and well-being, I can make different decisions for myself, for my community, and for the systems I'm part of. So, uh, so this is the second layer of the alive. This is how do we regenerate real wealth in our lives again. The third layer of the livelihoods is, um, am I doing work that is changing the rules and policies to benefit communities rather than corporations? Right now, the global economic system that is in place is giving tremendous amounts of subsidies and um, uh, um, benefits to global corporations. So. Um, the shift in the power structures, if we don't talk about that in the work we're doing, uh, we will never be able to really change the, change the, change the game, uh, as I say. So can we bring more work that is giving power back to communities? Because we see today that there's a handful, maybe 100 corporations actually are making majority of decisions for the planet today. Um, and so we need to be part of work that moves that power back to local communities who are being affected by uh, the choices, the decisions they make. Um, and, you know, much of the, the you know, if we think about it, um, for example, um, we see that organic food is more expensive in most countries than uh, pesticide, chemical, poisonous food. And why is that? It's because, not because that process is more expensive, it's because of the subsidies that governments are giving to global corporations. So in India, for example, um, it's almost a uh, um, hundred times more subsidy is given to the pesticide industry 
then to local farmers um, who want to grow um, organic food. So unless we start to somehow shift the subsidy game, um, it's very difficult for us to uh, replenish, uh, recharge, regenerate our local ecosystems again. Um, so uh, this is the third level is how do we shift the power structures uh, and move power back into the hands of local communities. Um, and the fourth um, level is, am I doing work that helps society go beyond an extractivist military economy, the bulldozer that we saw on the first slide, uh, besides a, and shift our worldviews. So this entire series that uh, has been happening of talks has been basically about how do we shift our worldview, a worldview that tells us that uh, many things that uh, 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 the planet is, is uh, uh, human beings are the only intelligent force on the planet, a worldview that says that the soil is not alive, the, the soil is actually dead, the worldview that says um, water is just a material thing, you know, and we like to ask in India, you know, the Ganges, the Ganga is called the mother here. And so I, I you know, uh, rather than what is water, we, which we are taught in school, you know, H2O, H2O and all of this, I would offer the question in this, who is water? Who is water, you know, and who is the soil? Uh, so shifting our worldview to understand that there is a more than the more than human world has its intelligence, its connection, its influence on and shaping us. Uh, we are not the masters of nature. We are part of nature. So unless we shift this worldview, um, uh, this idea also that, as I said earlier, the um, one of the greatest, I think, uh, uh, philosophical uh, puzzles we're in is that um, we were told uh, that the West is materialist and the East is spiritualist. And I think this is a lie. Uh, we have grown up with a tradition all over Asia of spiritual materialism, that spirit and matter are interconnected. And this makes a fundamental difference of how we relate to the rest of the beings we inhabit the planet with. It rates a fundamental difference in how we see our, um, how, uh, how we see our purpose uh, 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 on this planet, that maybe we are not owners. So the whole tradition, for example, of copyright in our university and our work in ecoversities, we talk about copy left. Maybe we're not the owners of knowledge or the owners of land or the owners of, of uh, the the minerals or the 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 soils or the um, oil, but maybe we're trustees, and maybe, trustee has a very different kind of relationship. Maybe we're, our role is uh, uh, fundamentally to 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 care for the coevolution of all life, not just of the uh, human evolution. So I think this this idea of worldview is something that needs to shift and and. You know, a series like we are part of uh, are one step in that. But how do we amplify that? Because um, as long as, you know, there's a beautiful saying, which I, I love to, uh, which is a Native American saying, is what you people call your natural resources, we call our relatives. So unless our worldview shifts back to this idea that uh, our uh, that, that we need a different frameworks, different tools to understand a world where we're relatives with the rest of life. We're not the masters. Uh, I think we won't be able to change the game much unless we can change that. So these four levels of work are needed. And we offer this in terms of how we think about our careers, our careers that we're doing, move, helping us to move in this direction. And, and um, on the top of this diagram, you see... Uh, Green jobs has become a very famous favorite saying in, in a lot of the environmental and climate circles. SDGs is the sustainable development goals, social entrepreneurship. These are being offered. And I say that these are very important, but they're very limited because they're being treated as add-ons to the existing game, to the existing system. 
um, that these are things you can just add on and keep the same uh, machinery, the industrial, military, extractivist machinery in place, and we can add on. And these, these um, don't invite us really to look at the root causes of the crises. So if you see the sustainable development goals, for example, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a wish list of, of problems that are happening. But it doesn't look at what are the root causes of this. And we can look at the root causes and see that there is a, as I said, a spiritual crisis, a system design crisis, the way the economies are being structured and violence is being subsidized. You know, um, when I was a student, I remember uh, I, one of the studies, I, sub subjects I studied was economics. And I had a professor who told me, you know, what is the best thing you can do when your economy starts to go down? He told me the best thing, he taught us in the class, the best thing you can do is start a war. And he detailed how over the last 300 years, the United States, every time their economy started to go down, they started a war and that created it. And we can see many economies in the world are tied to the idea of war. So unless we actually start to um, look at the roots of the crisis, I think we are further slipping down the uh, the path towards uh, extinction, self-extinction. Uh, so I, I think that's one of the invitations is as, as we're looking at what career I'm doing, it does it give me the space to keep asking questions about what is at the roots of this crisis? Um, because I think as we go deeper and deeper into asking that, we'll, it'll inspire us to look at um, what needs to be done in very different ways. Uh, so that's one thing I would offer. The second thing is that I think there's a notion of um, all over Asia, voluntary simplicity. Um, these days in Japan, for example, the um, movements to declutter our lives, um, uh, uh, there's a sense that, you know, there's a Sufi saying here, we say more possessions, more possessed. The more possessions you have, the more possessed you, you, you are. Um, there's a movement towards simplicity that we have to invite. And I think um, in my own spiritual tradition of Jainism, we had this concept called uh, less is more. So we are trained in the modern uh, uh, mindset to um, think that if I have less things, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to, something is going to de decline in the quality of life. And I think we need to uh, um, flip that on its head and saying that maybe having less things means I can enjoy those things and the, my life much, much more than what I'm doing by cluttering and adding more and more things into my life. So I would also, when we talk of a livelihood, invite this notion of, of a different notion of simplicity. Uh, simplicity as freedom uh, uh, is a very critical part of freedom I would invite into this. And the third thing I wanted to just add to this um, uh, notion of a livelihood is um, the focus on localization that's very needed. And my localization has many um, uh, dimensions, maybe first being that uh, trying to... Um, Re, uh, recalibrate, or realign um, the production and consumption uh, to, you know, um, within, within maybe 100 kilometers. Majority of your production and consumption should be within 100 kilometers is, is something we would offer. Um, so how do we do that? You know, in the U.S., <laughs> the, the average... Uh, uh, food travels more than 1,500 miles. So we are shipping things here, there, everywhere. Uh, most of what things we don't even need, but um, uh, uh, we can try to reimagine how do we rebuild our local economies where we, re re where we produce the majority of what we need. And when we produce it, then we know um, who's paying the cost of it or what is the environmental damage being done because we can see it around us. Um, 
The other part of that is I think is we need to focus much more on how do we bring local investment uh, into whatever we're doing. So this is very important because right now, you know, if I ask people where uh, your money uh, that you have, where is it? Most people will say it's in banks. So the banks are taking that money invest and investing it again in the deadlyhood corporations. Uh, and we don't know, most of the time people are not thinking about where is my money being invested. Um, and so oftentimes we're supporting things that um, even things we may not really believe in or want to see, see as healthy for the planet, uh, life on the planet. So idea is that can we take um, more and more of our resources and pool them to create the kinds of uh, uh, a livelihoods that we would like to see a food system. So we have a friend here, for example, that we are working with several friends who are looking at the local food system again. And this is a very good place to start for livelihoods is if we can take control back again over our food systems from global corporations. Um, can we invest in those? Can we support local organic food being produced? Um, and our idea of organic food is not something that's only for rich people. Real organic food would be affordable by everyone. This is the idea that we can have a system where everybody can afford it, where it's also good for the soil, it's good for all of the other living beings, the birds and the butterflies uh, and the bees um, and many of the wild animals. Uh, and so how do we use organic food to repair our also ecosystems? So can we invest into that? That is one of the things we've been looking very closely is to bring investment, lots of people we mobilize to, to support that so that everybody in the city, a, a dream that where everybody in the city can eat local organic food. That's one of the things that we are, for example, we're working uh, uh, under as a livelihoods. And the other thing is, to, uh, as an extension of that is, how do we build a, um, can we, rather than thinking about this in terms of my farm, uh, or I'm producing food for my organic food, which is a lot of where people who have some uh, financial resources think, okay, I'll make my own farmhouse, which I'll grow organic food. We're trying to build a model where we're saying, can we make the entire district that we live in organic? Um, and that's part of the livelihoods is that we start to think not just in terms of a single business, but actually a model where thousands of farmers can be part of an organic dream the dignity of farmers is also being reclaimed and re, uh, um, uh, uh, and farmers, uh, you know, today, and fortunately, a lot of all over India, a lot of people don't want their children to become farmers because they don't see a future in farming. But part of a livelihoods would to say that, okay, can we not only make it um, uh, viable for a person doing farming to take care of their families uh, and their basic needs, but also, can we give it dignity? So I like to say that, you know, <clears throat> two things I, I love to say. Um, there's a phrase in Hindi, Jai Kisan, Jai Bhagwan. So I say, if you want to meet God, go and meet a farmer. Support a local farmer. And um, the farmers actually, I hold even in higher esteem. We're trying to build campaigns around that so that they are equally valued as doctors. Because if they're giving us good, healthy, local food, we won't get sick. So they're helping us in a prevention mode from sickness. The doctor is only helping you when you get sick, cure. So can we redefine the whole story around the farmer and then think about a farm economy? So what is the, um, you know, if you think about a farm economy for the entire district, then you need uh, um, uh, many, many different kinds of a livelihood professions to support that. You need people who are um, very skilled at farming and farm management. You need people who can create all kinds of um, uh, uh, products around, um, you know, bio, bio recharging products, like for the soil recharging, for, uh, for, you know, repelling pests, all kinds of organic bio products are there. You need people who can, um, uh, who are working with kids and helping to reorient them around farming and food. You need people who are uh, good at um, 
uh, who want to run uh, nurseries around native seeds and uh, native species. Uh, uh, you need people who want to do events, uh, which um, get people together and rebuild the community fabric. You need people who uh, love cooking and can create all kinds of organic cafes and uh, organic products to work with farmers. So there's a whole bunch of, of, of uh, um, a livelihoods get, that can converge if you have a dream of, for example, around your food system. The, I'll just close with, uh, uh, you know, just to give you more practical examples, uh, you know, so we have many friends who are looking at livelihoods in different ways. So basic thing would be, you know, with our, um, uh, uh, our food, as I mentioned, um, our um, clothing. So we have many people who are trying to redesign the, the, the fabrics we use, uh, the particularly, there's a lot of um, poisons that are used in the dyeing process. So they're working on natural dyeing. There are other friends of ours who are saying, you know, there's, you know, I, uh, thousands and thousands of tons of clothes which are being wasted every year. And many of them end up in dump sites uh, and they're adding to the carbon emissions, for example. Uh, and so can we have careers where people are actually upcycling the clothes, making new clothes out of them? Uh, we have some people who are working on that uh, in India with us. We have people who are looking at alternative um, uh, kinds of uh, housing, eco-housing, which are using bamboo and mud and traditional stones and, and many things. We have people who are working on regenerating our water systems. So one of the big crises, I think, all over Asia is around water um, and how do we regenerate those water systems. So there are many people who are working on that. There are people who are working on, as I said, rebuilding the community fabric. So the, the last thought I would like to leave you with is probably the most important thing that's needed is trust. How do we build the fabric of trust between people? Um, I talk about this a lot is that... Um, uh, there's what I call the um, exponential possibility of trust. When you have trust in the world, uh, in your community, uh, and you get people to work together across sectors, across uh, uh, classes, across uh, different ethnic groups, uh, uh, and get people from the government and, and nonprofit and activists and local businesses to work together. There's all kinds of possibilities for building new systems that can happen uh, through that, once that trust. So we need to have many, many kinds of events. I'll give you an example. We run um, every, every Saturday in our university, we run a Saturday slow food cafe, which is run in the spirit of gift culture. So it's, uh, contribute people come and volunteer there some people contribute for bring their grain some people contribute some money whatever but it's a community cafe where we can we rebuild rebuild relationships and trust and people their families people come as families also um, and there's music there's games there's food but the idea is by one of the simple ways to be rebuilding trust is through music through food uh, through dance. These are ancient technologies that we have in our cultures um, through praying together even uh, that we can start to build some fabric of trust again. Because I grew up, um, uh, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. and there was always this culture, don't trust anybody, don't trust your neighbors, don't trust the strangers, don't trust anyone. And unless we uh, uh, start to heal ourselves from that, um, it's very difficult to think about how we are going to change the systems that are in place, these deadlyhood systems. So I would uh, maybe close with that thought and invite questions um, for uh, from the from the the group here. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Manish. Thanks for. I know that I I know that um, you will open it with again and yeah. That was like really Manish, Manish. 
Um, and I also see the connections with uh, Satish talk, for example, and also Ohms, like Satish talk about copy left and Ohms also talk about this community of all beings. Yeah. If we don't change our worldview, it seems we won't have a real a livelihood. So I can see like as a, a last speaker of the whole series this year, you are connecting like all the dots from um, different speakers. And I see like a, the whole of this series is uh, in merging. And I also very um, appreciate like you, you kind of deconstruct a livelihood like through talking about the change of worldviews, um, about our lifestyle, how we can um, lead the more simple life. And you said is you mentioned uh, the voluntary simplicity and also the localization movements. And I feel like, and, and also you, la uh, you leave uh, with uh, four questions. I feel like it's the very important, like four questions for our life that we can ask ourselves and we can ask each other. And, and it offer really a, a helpful framework for us to to reflect and also to design our life um forward um yeah um i can like have give more and more comments but like because of the time limit that we are gonna open for q a so we have around um uh, 35 minutes for q a and please um open your mic uh, uh sorry wait a second um, you can ask questions, you can share your uh, thoughts, you can engage in conversations and um, please uh, type all your questions, comments, um, 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 thoughts in the chat box in e either English or Chinese and our dear translators will help us um, to translate and, um, and then we can start from there and I see any, um, ah, okay, so maybe, uh, I haven't seen any questions. Maybe as the translator, I will take a take the chance to ask uh, without hesitation. Um, um, so I I know many people are um, transitioning, like in a life and um, transitioning um, stage, but sometimes they found it hard to make peace with the previous life, like what you said before twenty eight, and many people have their transition in 28 somehow. Um, how do you see your life before 28? Um, is this something like you already proved yourself like to the world that you can like succeed in like all those things and then you can do whatever you like or you are like you go through, um, went through a process of denial, for example, or you, you saw it as a gift in your life, a life gift that you can experience all those where you, you learn like, by um, how we can grow the economic is by making war, for example. This is what you learn from your professors, as you said. Um, this is the first question I would like to ask. And the second one is that very practical one. How do you raise your, I remember you, you have a daughter. So how do you raise your daughter? Do you still send her to Harvard? Um, mm -hmm. Because some <laughs> of us here are parents and we, have, we are facing parenting dilemma. How do you hold your daughter's hands on this spiritual material, material well, what you said, spiritual materialistic path? So this is the two questions I have, and I also saw the hand. So maybe we can start um, the conversation from here. Thank you. Yes. So uh, thank you, Ying. They're great questions. Um, let me start with the second one first. So um, after I went to Harvard, uh, I kind of decided that the entire um, uh, formal education, um, so I never liked studying, I should say that, <laughs> but but I was very good at faking it. <laughs> so, and then I realized I was so good at faking it, I ended up to, at a Harvard. But then after being there, I started feeling that maybe I've become fake, totally fake. So, so then I had to start to recover myself, you know, like, um, so much of my own spirit, my soul, I felt I had lost in getting to that because I was always trying to compete in that game, play that game, please others also in that game. So when my wife and I uh, decided to get married, um, I was quite clear that I didn't believe in the formal education system uh, as it is what I call factory schooling because I said this system actually doesn't... Um, 
bring us uh, closer to ourselves or to nature. It's actually designed to distance us. Um, I would almost say that it creates a sense of self-hate. Uh, self-hatred is one of the purposes that I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not intelligent enough. I'm not uh, enough as I am. Um, and so I'm always looking for some external validation, some external product, which is very good for global consumerism um, if I'm not happy with who I am. And so I felt that, and then I, then I have to go on, after all this damage, then I have to go on a spiritual journey to fall in love with myself again and understand myself is not limited to just this body, but it's a whole web of relationships that I keep. You know, if you ask my grandmother, I told you never went to school. She didn't know reading and writing, but I realized she's more intelligent maybe than my Harvard professors. She understood life. And this worldview of all these things, all these great speakers uh, have been speaking in the last few months. Um, she not only understood it, she knew how to live it. And so I, I said, maybe she's a better guru for me. And uh, so my, we never sent my uh, daughter, never went to school. She's never looked at a textbook. She's never looked at an examination. Um, I started a university called Swaraj University where people who don't like school or don't believe in school um, can come there. People, even the school system fails so many youth, puts so many youth in depression. Uh, uh, so um, the universe, our university, we, we actually specialize. We love to take dropouts and failures. From the uh, and we take them and my and also people who've never gone to school like my daughter. Um, so she has been pursuing her own livelihoods, but I think as I said, first a livelihood starts with knowing yourself and feeling alive and happy with who you are. Um, and then and that's all of the you know all the spiritual gurus all over Asia, all over the world will say you know. First, first learn to be happy with yourself, you know, uh, you're good enough. And so I think that she's grown up with that feeling. Um, and, um, and then what is the work? So she's been working on uh, with fashion designers on natural dyeing fashion. One of her areas is music to bring together people. She's a musician, she's an artist, trying to tell a storyteller. So she likes to do many different things. Um, and she's learned that all practically. So. One of the things I think, uh, I, you know, I, I say this in a little bit of a joke, but quite seriously, that I believe even child labor. So not the sweat, not the sweatshops, child labor that we see exploitative, violent. But I think that children should be able to do voluntary work, uh, meaningful work when they're children and their farms, helping in their houses. This is not child labor. This is actually and, and it's so disappointing every year. When you see these UN posters of child labor, International Child Labor Day, it's like a kid farming. Like, how is that? How is that a child labor? That kid is connecting to so much. His ecosystem is the rest of nature, the animals. So many beautiful things are happening, and we think it's child labor. Or the education system says it's he's wasting or she's wasting our time doing those things. So I think there's a whole. Reimagine. That's what the idea of ecoversity is. Is is that our we are suffering from uh, monoculture of the mind. That the way we are being trained to think about the crisis and to work on the crisis is part of the crisis. You know. So and and so we need to create all kinds of new educational spaces, uh, learning spaces. Um, in ecoversities, we talk about like the forest versity. What if the guru is the, the, the forest, that we can learn from the forest? Or what Satish, what Satish said, the soil versity. What if the soil is our guru? Or what about the uh, river versity? Or what about the grandmother's university? Or what about the traveler's university? Where all over Asia, again, pilgrimages were so important to the, to the uh, journey for people. Uh, but the edu formal education system never encourages us to, it says, again, you're wasting time. You should focus on exams, get good, good marks. But we're saying, no, traveling is one of the best teachers in life. Um, so there's all kinds of, of um, uh, you know, or the fisherman's diversity. What if 
we learn from the the fishermen or the the farmers you know like these are people we were told all over asia these are uneducated but i think part of the shift of worldview is to start to understand that maybe these people these communities have much more to offer us in how to get out of the mess that we have created on the planet uh, this extractivist militaristic deadlyhood mess many of these communities have much to do to show us the way out of it and if uh, we get rid of the label that they're uneducated or they're illiterate or they're stupid then maybe we can open ourselves to learning in a different way so i've been trying to do that my daughter many of our our learners who are part of our system um, are on that path of trying to recover and our indigenous our indigenous knowledge systems have never been valued by the university uh, or if they're valued, then the, the holders of them, the true holders are not valued. So I was just talking to somebody, a vice chancellor of a, of a government university. I said, why aren't you not giving the, the farmers, you should give them all honorary degrees, or you should give the, 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 uh, the, the people who know about medicinal plants, the, the villagers, the shamans, the healers, Give them medicinal, give them honorary degrees because they're the true knowledge holders. They're the ones who are willing to even share their knowledge. They don't believe in the copyright regime. They would like something very different. They understand life very differently. So we need to honor them. So that is part of our, our core work is that we need to shift our educational institutions. But as I said, that nobody in, who goes to school, very few people, I would say less than percent actually care about learning. I said at the talk of the talk, the start of the talk, they care about the financial financial package. If you were to remove this saying and tell people, well, you go to school, you you won't get a job. We're not guaranteeing you any job. I think the majority of people would leave schools. They wouldn't waste their time there. So we're also inviting with the livelihood is a new kind of education. Gandhi used this term, head, heart hands and home and today the modern university only again trains us for the head it doesn't revalue and it almost gives us shame you know i think this is something that is so sad that people who work with their hands are looked upon by modern educated people on the lowest as the lowest people working with your hands and what in all over asia uh we had this understanding that the hands and working with them is part of a spiritual path. That working with our hands is not separate from our spiritual path. It is very much, and this is why we had such amazing craft and beautiful things being created because people didn't think I'm just a product. They believe that I this is the, the, the I am channeling the divine energy and making beauty. And this is my spiritual work in the world. So it's a very different orientation about work i think that's fundamental to the uh, livelihoods is i'm not just doing work to feed my belly or to buy a new iphone but it's part of my spiritual path and we need to realign these two things and the other thing you are asking is about how about people in transition so one of the things we um I, i've been uh writing about a little bit with some friends is this idea of what we call sponging so how do you sponge off your family and friends to uh, bring the livelihoods and to save the save humanity and the planet? So sponging, I mean, is that um, we have a whole web of relationships and resources that are tied to those relationships. So many people I know whose families are fairly stable, middle class families, they have some security stability. Those people are telling their children, oh, you go into the rat race. Don't do work on your dream. You start your dream after you're retired when you're 60 years old. So I'm telling them, no, you know, like even for my own work, I told my mother, I said, look, you know, whenever you pass from this life, whatever you saved is going to come to me and my sister. So why don't you give it to me now so I can live my dream and do something beautiful rather than waiting till I'm, you know, 70 years old and i can't do anything and so luckily she agreed and she gave something to support our work 
to move it forward so that we didn't have to. So I think if we think about the not only immediate family, but our web of relationships, we can actually work on our storytelling, our invitation uh, to invite people to contribute to the kind of uh, livelihoods that needs to be created. I think that's one of the key learning edges um, that uh, if we work on it, people on this call, I would imagine have some connection to people who have different financial resources. So how do we channel? And I'd say that maybe it doesn't feel good to ask for yourself. So then you have to tell your friends, you say, look, I will tell my parents that I have three friends. Can you give them a scholarship to work on their livelihoods? And then you you tell your friends to tell them, your their parents, oh, can you give my friends like me a scholarship to work on? So it creates a little bit of spaciousness that, you know, like otherwise it gets very tense sometimes with the family uh, to take resources and people try to avoid. But let us be more creative because we need to bring those resources from Wall Street, from the global economy back into our local communities. Unless we've learned how to do that and in into the livelihoods we want to see, um, it'll just be a lot of empty talk at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Um, by elaborating um, more of a life, a li a livelihood, and like, I can feel your passion and your true belief. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw the few hands here. I don't know whether, Vinny, you would like to ask um, the question. Oh, you already typed it here. Uh, wow. Um, I just want to recall. So. Next. Um, so Winnie, she asked maybe because as oh, I also um, seeing uh, not a few hands, so maybe I will pick one um, out of these three. Hmm. Um, as you started uh, a game um, in this um, talk, Winnie, one of the questions she asked is that do you recommend any games like either online or in person? Um, yeah. This is one of her questions. Yeah, so I can recommend, I can send some websites, but I think that the metaphor of game is very interesting. So uh, there's a game called Musical Chairs, which many, which I think is one of the most violent games uh, that is played with children and all over the world it's being played where children are being taught that there's only one chair and everyone has to, you have to fight with your friends and the people you care about to try to grab that chair and do whatever. You can bite them, you can kick them, you can cheat, but you have to grab that chair. So I think that's the dominant game. And if you don't grab it, then you're out. So a lot of the games, if you see the language of a lot of the games that children are playing is you make a mistake and you're out. And I think that uh, the, um, the um, the games that we we play, I have more than 300 games and I run workshops for people to say called redesigning the game. And we start with real games. So all these games which are competitive uh, um, and throwing people up, can we redesign those games? If we start to do it at the level of a game, then we can start to see how it can be applied to our life and the systems we have. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of resources for different collaborative games, co-creation games. Um, and I think that, that it starts from there is that our whole orientation, our worldview gets shaped by the way we play. Um, and I think that this one, I, and I, I think the other reason I started, I like to start with games is that we need to bring a spirit of playfulness in all of this work. There's too much, you know, just being serious, serious, serious. Um, there was a... a, a a uh, friend of mine who said, you know, if your revolution is boring, it's not going to go very far. So I think we have to bring the spirit of playfulness and joy because otherwise there's so much, you know, if you just read the newspaper, you're depressed, you feel hopeless. If you if you uh, watch, watch the news on internet, you feel de de depressed and hopeless. Um, and so I think that, and even if you talk to activists, you feel depressed and hopeless most of the time. Uh, so I think we need to find playfulness and that 
um, to get out of, you know, there's a other thing we talk about is called the prototyping paradigm. Mm. So many people, you know, rather than, and in Hindi, the word is jugard. It's called, jugard means playful improvisation. So I don't think that there's any master plan, any utopian plan for how do you get out of this whole extractivist military deadlyhood place. We're going to have to have thousands of different local experiments running and relationships being built, trust being built. And we need to do it with a spirit of playfulness. We have to test things out. We're going to have to prototype them. We're going to have to learn from those mistakes. Uh, we have to become more bold to make mistakes. If we're going to be sitting in fear of making mistakes, we're not going to be able to build a new the new kinds of systems, new kinds of models that the world needs. So I think that spirit of games is extremely important um, if we want to start to reimagine the larger game that's happening on the planet. And I'll share resources for Thank that you. for sure. I'd love Yeah. 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 We will follow yeah. to uh, we will forward it in the email um to yes. the audience. And um the next one, um Dor Dorothy. You will have the mic. Hello. Hi, this is Dorothy. Um, yeah, I, I thank you so much for Manish for your sharing. Um, the the work of corporations versus um, localization, I think it's definitely something I, I think about a lot. Um, my company is called Dream Impact, and we work with corporations on their ESG and impact strategies and implementation. Um, but it's definitely still playing the game, right? So I think um, it's also personally a struggle for me sometimes. Like I have this side where it's like, oh, we have to rebuild a new system and another way of working, um, localized, small, decentralized. But at the same time, the corporations have the resources and the greater networks uh, and the worldwide reach. So um, I'm definitely, and also I, I took a six month sabbatical traveling to India and Thailand and Hawaii to visit various regenerative communities. But then the moment I came back to Hong Kong, it's like I got sucked back into the, the machine and the rat race and I still have mm. to run the company. I still have to make, I have to pay the team. So it's like, I can't like for the six months, it felt like, oh, this is great utopia, building trust, dance, music, freedom. But then when I came back, it's like, I have to deal with very realistic issues. Um, so the question would be, what mm -hmm. do you think is the future role of corporations? Because they are efficient machines that can deliver goods and services worldwide to improve our quality of living and technological in innovations. Um, but how can, um, and that small local networks don't have. So how can corporations and local small networks coexist? Yeah, so I think I um, there's two levels I would answer your question. So one is, you know, um, most people, if you um, give them, um, um, uh, what do you, if you give them a, a shot of whiskey, a couple of shots of whiskey, whether they're corporate leaders or UN leaders or government leaders, they'll admit two things. They'll admit that they don't really know what's going on and what to do. And two, they'll admit that they don't really personally uh, agree with the game, actually. They're being forced to play it. Um, they don't see that they have any other options to play it, right? And so um, right now, what the, a large amount of the game from corporations is tied to two predominant solutions. One is finding market-based. So you see that with like carb, now the whole push for carbon credits and carbon markets. Um, and two is around finding some uh, quick fix technology, some technology, super technology that's gonna solve all of the problems. Um, and I think the invitation first is to start to unlearn that with corporations, that there's no quick fix technology, there's co no like market-based solution that is gonna just solve everything. These might be part of a larger solution for sure, but by themselves, standalone, they're not really gonna get us very far. Um, so I would first invite a lot of these corporate leaders into a kind of more deeper unlearning process. So what I'm saying is 
<coughs> not to, sorry, uh, not to, the, the strategy is not to make anyone evil. You know, these are the, these are the system is one thing and individuals. This is, I think when I was a young person, this is one of the paradoxes I learned is, you know, on Wall Street, you find some of the nicest, sweetest guys. One of my best friends, who's the most loyal, most loving guy, he's a managing director at Goldman Sachs, which is one of the, the most uh, horrible banks in the world, I think, in terms of what they're ecologically doing and part of supporting. But so let us not make people evil. Let's not ostracize people. But let us try to create spaces. So when I meet corporate leaders, I actually try to create a space where I can help them step out of their, they're not, they're not just their CEO or uh, managing director or title. They're much more human beings, right? So inviting them to step out of that role as that just seeing the world through that lens, back as seeing it as a father, as a brother, as a son, as a neighbor, um, as a part who somebody who's part of nature I, I think that's a much more uh interesting uh, even as a, as part of a spiritual seeker a fellow spiritual seeker these those things can open up much more possibilities for imagination and courage these are the two things we need is imagination and courage today and so one is that and then we can unlearn that maybe these are not real solutions that are being offered and the second thing is that as I said, like some of my projects, um, and, and sorry, for, just from the first role, like we are working with CSR people. We are working to try to build these livelihoods. So once we invite them into that role in a different role than what their one one condition role, but beyond that to their more human role or or even their more than human role, that they can actually start to become partners with creating a, a livelihood projects. And I think that that... Um, uh, second thing is what I said is to compost the money system. So they have fi financial money resources for sure. They have certain technologies, they have certain skill, but how do we compost that to start to build a uh, new system? So like that's what uh, this, this, I told you about this whole idea to make this entire district of Rajasthan uh, organic district with thousands of farmers involved. So we are working with some corporates who are actually channeling their resources to replenish local water systems, not to build big dams, to, but, but to build, for example, small water systems. How do they use that to help farmers build their own? Uh, one of the biggest things that small farmers face is they don't have um, storage facilities. So how can we use C corporate social responsibility funds to help local farmers have better storage facilities so that they can, you know, take care of their grains and clean them and process them at the local level. So there's a whole bunch of things that we can start to do in partnership. I think the idea is though that um, what I invite you to think again is what's your game that you're trying to invite them into and how is that game restoring real wealth? So many people, unfortunately, today I have a lot of friends because of the places I studied and worked who are in very high level positions all over the world, like heads and CEOs of organizations or um, uh, for-profit, non-profit. But I'm finding that very few of them have their own, have any other vision. They know what's wrong with the system, but they don't know what to do. And so we have to co-create together invitations to them that these are a different kind of game that you can play um, uh, that is going to also be aligned with your spiritual path that is aligned with happiness and love for your family, for your community, for things that you care about. So it's a, it's a very tricky thing. It's a difficult thing, but I think it's, um, if we have an idea of how we're regenerating wealth, real wealth, then we have something to, to invite and not everyone will be ready for it, but I think a lot of leaders are becoming more and more ready for it. And as we regenerate real wealth, as I said, the sense of abundance and possibility grows. If we're continuously looking at things through a scarcity fear perspective, those those are so narrow, the options. Um, so I think, uh, I hope this helps a little. We can have a longer, I'd love to talk about it with more, something we're also trying to explore a lot in our work. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. I think you, um... 
accidentally also answer some of the questions that in the um, chat box about um, how to actually um, coexist with um, the current worldview and also the current systems. And you mentioned, yeah, we can take people into an unlearning journey and awake the, their true self when they are not like a CEO in the company who they are. Um, and really co-create um, a new worldview together with people instead of ex like excluding them into in excluding um, these people in the game and invite people in. I, and I believe as human beings, we do our um, yearning for happiness and being kind to each other. I think there's a, a human nature um, in each one of us. And uh, there's a one comment in the chat box uh, from a primary school um, teacher. And she said um, in the curriculum, there's need to be a standardized um, curriculum, what to teach. But then children, they are all different. We are in like, we have different interests and we have different personalities. And, and um, yeah, I think she's kind of um, pointing out the, the, the reality of the deadlyhood. And I think um, there's some common um, commonality in these questions that it's hard for us to face deadlyhood, especially we have to play a part in this uh, system. But I feel like just now you gave a um, um, very inspiring um, point, how we can coexist, co um, co co unlearn with uh, everyone else. Um, let me see whether there's, um, I can add one more thing, you know, I, I'm yeah, encouraging please, please. a lot of people who, who get, who are understanding what's happening, uh, to, if possible, they can think of walking out of their job. So we need a combination of people who are working in the system and people who are working beyond the system, the existing global economic system. Um, and those people who are working beyond it, um, are the ones who are actually the most innovative. They're finding ways to do things differently. They're building new kinds of models. But, and, and so I'm, I'm uh, uh, the work I do is part of that. And I think that the way people in the system need to do as long as in, the, in that system working, find people who are outside of the system and see how you can support their innovations. They're, they're thinking, how do you channel, how do we channel resources back into these local communities and, and people who are trying to develop new kinds of models. I think as you know, some people, they need to be in a position where they're working in that company or in the government or in the system. Um, but then I, my invitation is to see at least how you can support people who are outside of it. And as long as uh, you can channel resources or sometimes, you know, like um, certain approvals are needed to work on these models uh the government needs to approve so maybe you can help push things a little bit forward you know like uh for example i'm working in the prison we have the jail university that reimagining the entire prison so you need friends sometimes the uh, uh who can who can um influence the 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 administration the jail administration encourage them to be more innovative uh, allow different kinds of things to happen there. So I think those are those are that kind of partnership spirit is something we have to cultivate. Um, and you know, one of the questions that I think is one of the most important questions because um, so some of the work I'm doing is on uh, with this work of complex challenges. And so that the the maturity that happens is that is that no one person or institution or ideology or approach can solve a complex challenge. You need many other diverse others. And most of the time, those diverse others will not agree with each other. Um, it may be even oppose each other. So my own, you know, both in terms of professional as well as spiritual, one of the paths I'm on is, can I sit with those people who I thought were my enemies, who are totally different than me in their thinking, who will even disagree with me, can I sit and try to find a way to, it doesn't have to, you know, there might be something, uh, 
small that I can start to work on together. For example, like, as I said, food is a very good area because everybody loves food, good food. So maybe that becomes a way to start to build a relationship. So this Sunday, uh, we're organizing a very uh, big millet, um, uh, organic millet food festival. And we have people from all people outside the system, inside the system. Many people come because everybody likes good food and interesting like to, so this is a way to build friendships. So friendship has to be at the core of this work. And if we focus on building friendships with people, um, it can open up again a lot of new possibilities. What I, what I feel is our imagination is very restrained because we think only in terms of what's possible at this present moment. But if you build those friendships, many things open up which you can't even imagine at this point in time happening because of those relationships. So I think it's a big part of this livelihood journey is can I start to sit with those people? It's very, very easy to label somebody the enemy or label somebody fundamentalist or, or some label somebody uh, you know greedy or whatever. But can I start to build a relationship of, of mutual care uh, with them to start to collaborate with them in, in certain things? Um, that's a big edge for this whole livelihoods work, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Manish, for laying out the whole picture. It's a complex challenge. It's not just like to change your job the other day. And thanks for sharing all the examples, your dreams and framework that we can follow. And um, um, yeah, and, and well, the time uh, flies. And I think um, we are almost at the end of today's uh, talk and and a couple um, reminders. Um, we have recorded um, this talk and we will send a recording in emails and also a survey link. Um, so welcome to share um, all the, re the recording to friends so that you, you start to build your allies and you start to like make friends. Um, and um, also, if you like to support um, Kaduri Earth Program and KFBG's nature conservation and education work, you are welcome to become a KFBG member so that you can stay updated with our latest project and initiative, including this talk, um, and then to connect in a larger um, like-minded community. And, um, Stay tuned with uh, CAP talk series next year. And Manish also already pointed like indigenous wisdom, which is actually the topic of the first talk next year um, by our dear teacher, Colin Campbell. And he will share about the power of ritual, learning from indigenous, indigenous wisdom. See all the talks, they are all well connected. Um, yeah, I think that is that's it. And I don't know whether Manish would like to um, share any final words or wishes or, yeah. Yes, thank you. It's been wonderful to be with you all. Um, I, uh, I really um, uh, see this as a start uh, to much longer conversations. I think the only thing one can do in these little talks is to uh, you know um, provoke something but I'm available I, I hope people reach out and would like to explore this more um, but this you know I just think in summary that the <coughs> you know this need is now to my spiritual path my voluntary my activism the way I pay my bills how do we all bring these together to create models for young for ourselves and for young people is, is one of the core questions um, that uh, I would like to bring in. How do we make the, the, the struggle, the revolution, the work we're doing, the um, joyful, playful, um, um, creative process, I think uh, uh, is, is the other thing I would offer because um, there'll be many challenges, but uh, if we have good energies and we're sharing that energies and can be our, our, our whole selves and that with our light and our shadow, 
I think um, there's a lot of possibilities. So the process also we need to bring attention to um, is, is, is how do we create the space for the process. And the last thing I would just offer is the space to practice together. So it's not like a magic thing like this. It's a whole different side of muscles, uh, of, under, of understandings, of intelligence, of intuition that we have to reclaim and rebuild for the livelihoods journey. So by practicing together, being together, I appreciate really that you're having this series of talks. People can keep coming together. Um, and hopefully we'll have a event together to bring everyone physically together also someday as my dream with Kaduri uh, to, to spend more and more time to, to care for each other, to inspire each other, to build together, co-create together. So thank you so much, everyone. It's been wonderful to be here.